Awesome. Kia ora and welcome to the Wildlands webinar series. My name is Rowan Sprague and I'm the coordinator of the New Zealand Wilding Conifer Group and a knowledge broker for the Winning Against Wildlands Research Program. Next, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Professor Ian Dickey. Ian is Professor of Microbial Ecology at the University of Canterbury. In his research, he uses molecular tools to determine the role of fungal communities and community and ecosystem level outcomes. Today, Ian will discuss the role of non-native fungi and wilding pine invasions and our wilding control programs. Now over to you, Ian. Great. Thank you, Rowan, and of course. Uh, hello to everybody who's on, on the uh, webinar. So, kia ora koutou katoa. Um, I'm Ian Dickey, as Rowan said, and I'll be talking to you about fungi as the hidden drivers of wild and conifer invasions. Um, but when we think about plant-fungal interactions, it's actually useful to go back and think about it in a broader context. So I'm going to start by going back in time to way back in time to when plants first crawled out of the ocean. And the reason this is important is because those first plants were really primitive. They lacked a lot of the structures that we consider essential today, but such as roots. And so the plants had to figure out a way to get nutrients. And from fossil evidence, what we know is that really quickly they started associating with fungi. So we can see these fungal hyphae and fungal arbuscules within roots from fossils that are 400 million years old. And we still see those in the roots of plants today. So those are what are known as our buscular mycorrhizae. And our buscular mycorrhizae work by, going, by forming structures within the plant root, but then extending from the plant out into the soil with fungal hyphae. And those fungal hyphae are really uh, focused on taking up nutrients like phosphorus and bringing that nutrient back to the plant. And because our buscular mycorrhizae are ancestral to all plants, most plants still have them. In fact, more than 80% of all plants still have our buscular mycorrhizae. The fungi involved are pretty boring. There are only a few hundred species and they produce small spores in the soil, not something you'd ever see or notice on a day-to-day -day basis, despite being pretty much everywhere. That was all good, and that's how history went for the first couple hundred million years. But about 150 million years ago, something special happened, and that was the evolution of pine trees. Um, when they evolved, they evolved a whole new type of symbiosis with fungi. So what they form are something called ectomycorrhizae. Ectomycorrhizae have the fungus growing around the outside of the root, but just like our buscular mycorrhizae, it's got hyphae that extend out into the soil. But these hyphae get much more abundant. In fact, they can really dominate the organic layers of soil. And they do play more roles. They get more capabilities. They're still taking up nutrients like phosphorus. But when ectomycorrhizae evolved, they evolved the ability to take up organic nitrogen directly and to short circuit the nitrogen cycle. And because of that ability, what we saw is a change in the world's forest. Before this time, before the evolution of pines, the, the world was covered with things like redwoods and podocarps. But because ectomycorrhizal plants could come in and lock up that organic nitrogen, they were able to take over those forests and start to dominate. Now, ectomycorrhizae are relatively rare. Only about 2% of plant species form ectomycorrhizae. But that 2% includes the forest dominance of almost the entire globe. So it includes all the pine trees of the northern boreal zone, all the phigales and nothophagales, that's the oaks and beeches um, that dominate uh, both north and southern hemisphere. Also things like eucalyptus and uh, manuka and kanuka all form ectomycorrhizae. So these are most of the most important forest trees of the world's ecosystems and also of the, of the uh, forest industry. The fungi involved are really diverse. So there's thousands and thousands and thousands of species of fungi involved, and they cross many different groups, uh, three different phyla uh, of fungi. So that brings us up to the pine situation. So what's going on with pines? Well, we know that pines were first introduced to New Zealand sometime around the 1850s. In fact, there's a pine at Mount Peel Station that we know was planted in 1859 and is still there. And that's the earliest one we've found. Um, when, that was a really common process. Pines were actually introduced not just to New Zealand, but also South America, South Africa, Australia, um, in, in large plantings into grasslands. But around the world, when they brought pines in, they faced a problem, which was that the pines were failing to grow. 
they would find a few seedlings would have good growth, good color, but the vast majority were dying. And what they realized, it was actually that process of trying to introduce pines and failing to do so that led us to understand that fungi played a key role in the success of these plants. So as early as 1930, people were saying, it is now being realized that care should be taken to introduce mycorrhiza, which are associated with a tree species. And that was equally true in New Zealand all the way up through the 1970s and 80s. Uh, you can find papers saying that poor establishment of trees is due to a lack of mycorrhizal development and that we should inoculate seed with mycorrhizal fungi in order to get mycorrhizae to develop, in order to get pines to grow. And so that's what was done, is there were very deliberate efforts to take uh, soil and fungi from established populations of pine, introduce that into the nursery. And with that technology, it is now possible to, to grow pines that are uniformly healthy and well-established, which is great. From a forestry perspective, it was that development that led to the New Zealand um, forestry industry. In fact, one of our top, one of the top three industries in the country because of recognizing the role of fungi. Of course, as we all know, there was a bit of a downside, which is it also led to the pine invasions. And so my research has been trying to understand what is the role of fungi moving out of those plantations that's actually driving this pine invasion. This started with work I did uh, about 10 years ago now, looking at uh, Pinus contorta and native beech up at Craggyburn Forest. And we went out and collected roots from under the invasive pine and under the native forest, and then used uh, DNA techniques to look at what fungi were present. I won't go through any of the techniques, but this is the sort of data we get. And this probably is really hard to read on your screen. That's just fine. All I want you to see is that there's an awful lot of blue here, which are all of the species of fungi we found associated with our native beech trees. At the top, there's a much smaller section of red, which are those fungi we found associated with pine. And if I just blow that up so you can see it better, those are the fungi we found associated with pine. And if you look at the most dominant, those that were most frequent, all of them were only associated with pine. They were never found on our native beech trees. We coded those as to where those fungi came from. And what we found is that all of those fungi, all the dominant fungi were alien species. So they were not native to New Zealand and they were co-invasive. They were, they were invading along with the pine tree. Now that's just looking at one stand. So more recently, we've been trying to understand this in more detail and understand the succession of fungi that come along with a pine invasion. So this is work that's been led by uh, Sarah Sapsford, who's a postdoc in my lab. And she's been looking at the fungal community in grasslands, in areas of where pine invasions are just starting, and then all the way up to really dense uh, pine invasions. This is one of, the, one of her results. This is looking at when you look at all of the DNA in soil, what sort, what is the functional groups of fungi that you find? And in green, what she's showing are those species that are ectomycorrhizal. And you can see at the left-hand side, they, there's no pine in those first three bars. And we see very few ectomycorrhizal fungi and a dominance of saprotrophic fungi. So those are the fungi that are helping decompose organic matter and release nitrogen forms that any plant can take up. As pines invade, what we're seeing is a loss of those saprotrophic fungi and a real increase in these ectomycorrhizal fungi. So a total shift in the way that soils are functioning. We can look at communities in terms of an ordination space, and this is a little complicated, but it's just a way of looking at, at similarity between individual samples. So points closer together are more similar and those farther apart are more different. And what she's done is shaded these points with the amount of pine on the plot. And what you can see is a gradient in the fungal community. So the predictable shift from the grassland community. And by the time you're at the densest plots, what we see is that it's the, the composition has completely changed. This came along with some big changes in diversity. We see that ectomycorrhizal fungi, these are those that are associating with the pine roots, are increasing in diversity. So they're slowly accumulating more species as the pine invasion goes along. But the numbers are, are quite small. There's only a, a small handful of species involved. Conversely, saprotrophs, those are the decomposers in the soil and the diversity of all fungi on the right show really large decreases. In fact, what we're finding is 
more than half of the fungal diversity is being lost from these plots as pine invades. So we're losing a lot of the native decomposers at the same time as we're gaining these invasive ectomycorrhizal fungi. We've looked at that in more detail, and I'd just like to go through some of the species. So again, this is looking at the basal area of the pine invasion, so how much pine did we have, and what were the key species of ectomycorrhizal fungi involved? In the grasslands, we had this fungus called Suillus. So Suillus looks like this. It's a, it's a small brown mushroom, um, and it's a fascinating fungus because it's the one that's coming in first. It's right at the forefront of the invasion, and in fact, this is a rare case where ecology seems to be consistent across countries. So work from other countries, particularly in South America, has also found the same species of fungus is driving the invasion there. It's also interesting in that in South America, they're now collecting it and selling it as an edible fungus, um, which has not yet happened in New Zealand. Suillus is important, but it's not, uh, sorry, Suillus is important as the first fungus that comes in, but it's not actually the dominant fungus. So once the pine invasion is established, what we're seeing is this really interesting fungus called Cystotrema. And this was a real problem for us. We actually found this fungus back in the 2010 study, but at that point we couldn't identify it. When we put its DNA into the international databases, it only came back with a very poor match. So we could only, we knew what order it was in, but not what species it was. But then a friend of mine, Tom Bruns, who's a professor in, in California, happened to be out collecting fungi and saw this little white crust on pine needles. And that turns out to be an almost perfect DNA match to the fungus that's invading in New Zealand. So we're now able to actually put a name on it as being cystotrema. It doesn't produce a mushroom we'd necessarily notice, but it's quite ubiquitous in the pine invasion. The last fungus I'll mention in particular is this one, which is ammonita. Ammonita is the pretty one. This is the one that everybody thinks of as being the classic mushroom. It's only present once the pine has established as mature trees. So it's really important in the later stages of invasion, but not actually driving the invasion front. And of course, this is the one that shows up in children's books as sort of the iconic uh, fungus that everybody knows about. So overall, what we're seeing is this succession where we've got Suillus coming in very early, driving the invasion front, but then being replaced or, or, or overcome by the cystic tremor, which is really the, the dominant player in the ecosystem. And then over time, this accumulation of other species of fungi. We've also been looking at Douglas fir. Um, so this was worked by Holly Muller at Stanford University. And I won't go to the, into this in detail, but what she's found is very similar to the situation on pine. We're seeing mostly non-native or exotic fungi that are co-invading with pines. The only difference with Douglas fir is that when Douglas fir establishes under native forest, we see a, a number of native species of fungi do start crossing over onto it. The other key difference is that here, the dominant fungus, the most important one is this one, which is called rhizopogon. So rhizopogon is a little truffle-like fungus that forms in the soil. And it's really an important fungus because it's got a, a really good ability to persist. Its spores can stay in the soil for decades and remain infective. So this gets to the question of how are the fungi actually getting to New Zealand? And then how are they spreading once they get here? So one way they get here is by moving plants. We've found historic records of things like the, the pine tree I mentioned earlier if you read the caption, it says it was germinated from a seed in Sydney in 1856 and moved with its roots and soil to Mount Peel in 1859. And that turns out to be a really common way that plants were, were moved in the 1800s, was not as seed, but as actual plants. So in the case of pines, we know that they went through a really circuitous route. They were first moved in around 1830 from uh, their native range in, in the Western United States to England, where they were grown in botanic gardens. It wasn't until around 18, in the 1850s that they were moved perhaps first to Australia and then to New Zealand. But at least the movement from England to Australia and Australia to New Zealand was probably, and we can't prove it, but it was probably with soil and the fungi were actually growing on the plant roots. We do know this also for other species, for example, oak trees in Hagley Park. We know that they were actually imported as trees um, that were brought during the dormant part of the year and then actually set into the river to recover from the transport. So that's sort of how some of these non-native fungi probably got into the country. 
Once they were here, we know there were deliberate efforts to spread some of them. So foresters, in the, particularly in the 1970s and 80s, took things like rhizopogon and brought it into nurseries in order to get the better growth in the, in the uh, forest plantations. But that's not the whole story because it still has to move from the plantation out into the grassland. So to look at that, one of my colleagues, Jamie Wood, did a study of this, um, looking at the actual dispersal agents of, of the fungi. And so we put out some night vision cameras and there's a, a mushroom there, you can just see it. And what we can see is this red deer coming into the shot and very deliberately seeking out the fungus and eating the portion of that fungus that has the spores on it. That's not the only suspect here. We can also see this possum from Australia, again, eating a mushroom and seemingly going directly for this spore containing tissue. So we know that non-native mammals are consuming these fungi. It's another question whether they're actually dispersing them. So we went out to the field and we collected feces of these animals and then used DNA and spore counts, direct spore counts to look at what fungi were present. And we found evidence, not just of uh, non-native invasive fungi like rhizopogon and suillus, but also of a wide range of native species as well um, that these mammals were eating. We then wanted to see if it was actually viable, whether this was being passed from the animal through its feces to seedlings. So we took the feces, we turned it into sort of a, 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 a slurry with water, and then we applied it to seedlings of native beech trees, pine trees, and Douglas fir. So what I'm gonna show you is the percent of seedlings that actually started to form mycorrhizae when inoculated with these two types of feces. And so when we brought in the, the deer feces, what we found was that there was no infection of the native beech seedlings, but up to 20% of pine seedlings were getting infected with ectomycorrhizal fungi, showing that the deer were effectively dispersing these fungi. But the possum is where they're real dispersers. Here, when we applied the feces of possum to seedlings, we found more than 50% of pines and Douglas fir were becoming mycorrhizal. But again, although these mammals were eating the native um, species of fungi in their diet, so we saw spores of the native fungi, when we looked at what actually grew onto the seedlings, it was only the non-native species that were able to survive that passage through the gut and then infect the trees. So what this suggests to me is that pine invasions are not just an invasion of a plant, but are actually a co-invasion process of a whole novel ecosystem comprising the plant, a diverse community of different fungi, each of which is playing a different role in succession, and then these non-native mammals that are coming in and eating those fungi and helping disperse them. Even more interestingly, if you think about this for a minute, this is a North American tree that's, be, that's invading. It's associating with fungi that are largely from Europe, probably reflecting that movement from Europe to, to New Zealand of trees. And then it's being dispersed both by red deer, which are European, and by an Australian possum. So we have an almost United Nations of a novel ecosystem here that's taking over New Zealand. Which is a bit depressing, so what do we do about it? What have, what have I learned through this research and what are the, some of the take home messages we can go through? Most importantly, reinvasion is not invasion. So when you've had a site invaded by pine, it's important to recognize that there's been a change here and that change is in the soil. So we've seen an accumulation of ectomycorrhizal fungi and a loss of the native uh, decomposer community that was in that soil. So we need to consider that, that once pine has invaded an ecosystem, that ecosystem has changed and we need to take that into account in our management. The second lesson is a little harder to take, which is that these grasslands that people value so highly as part of the iconic la landscape of New Zealand were induced by largely post-European by burning and grazing. We now know from our data that Swillis is present in those landscapes, that the spores of this fungus are already there. And so maintaining this as a grassland may simply not be sustainable. We may need to start considering how do we restore this not back to a grassland, but maybe to native woody vegetation that can actually shade out pine seedlings and prevent invasion. To the extent that we can manage invasions at, at the forefront, 
we need to be managing it at this stage. We can't wait till it's, the pines are well established. So there's a pine tree. Not easy to see at this stage, but there it is. And that's the stage where we can probably effectively remove pines without seeing these changes in the soil community. Lastly, and this will be a topic of a paper we're working on right now, we need to move beyond the focus on killing. It's important that we understand how to kill pines and remove pines, but we need to start focusing on outcomes. If we're going to remove the pines, what is the ecosystem we're trying to achieve? And start thinking through how can we manage these soil legacies, these changes in fungal communities in order to achieve that, that outcome. And with that, uh, I'll end the talk there. So Namihi Nui, uh, thank you for listening. And I think Rowan will be passing through questions. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, that was great. I really enjoyed that. I love kind of the history um, of pine and fungal introductions. Um, but yeah, as well as now these lessons for what uh, all this means for our management. So we do have some questions. Um, okay. So the ectomycorrhizal associated with baleen pines cannot also form symbiotic relationships with I'm afraid I've just lost you, Rowan. You're you're not coming through. Peach, gums, and willows, so they don't jump across. Okay, I only heard part of that, but I think I understood the question. Am I? Whether... Oops, sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Um, I can hear you now. So I think the question was whether Ectomycorrhizae on pines can jump okay. onto other species. <laughs> um, the answer is absolutely yes, but mm -hmm. not all of them. So what we see, Ammonita muscaria, the bright red one that I showed you, is a classic example. So that one we're seeing invade into the native beach forest, um, into areas where there are no pines at all. Uh, so definitely we know of examples like that. Um, mm. Other fungi like Suillus and Rhizopogon are very specific to pines and Douglas fir, and so they're not going to spread into the forest, um, into our native trees. In okay. terms of crossing over to to other non-natives, uh, yes, we've seen Ammonita in particular growing on gum trees. So there you've got an association between a European fungus and an Australian tree that are for the first time associating in New Zealand. Um, alder and willow tend to have a somewhat different community. There is some crossover, but it's um, it's not a fungi I talked about today. So I think I'll, there's a paper we have out on that, but I think might leave that question aside for right now. Um, there are some really specific fungi on alder, and willow sort of associates with anything. Hmm. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, another question. So these pine-associated fungi are everywhere now, or do we not know how far they have spread? That's a really good question. Um, we have tried to look at that uh, with a couple studies, but we got the scale wrong. Uh, so we thought that maybe if we got 100 meters away from any pine tree, there would be no fungi in the soil. And the answer is no, that, that 100 meters away, we still find plenty of fungi. We haven't gone further yet. So one thing we would like to do is find areas that are completely uninvaded and do some trials on those soils. Um, but we haven't yet done that. So right now, we don't know. Uh, but it's a good question to ask. My guess is that there are still large areas where the fungi have not yet arrived. Okay. Um, okay, another question. Do you think native forest regeneration can be hindered by the presence of these exotic fungi, or is it more about the lack of native fungi? I think it's more about the lack of native fungi, but it is a fascinating question whether um, these non-native fungi are beneficial to our native trees or not. Uh, it's possible that ammonita is not particularly good for native forest regeneration, even though it does form mycorrhizae with native trees. And we, again, we have some data, but we just have more research to do to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, we've got a lot of questions coming in. This is awesome. Okay, uh, soil fungal communities seem to change quickly following pine invasion. Is the same true following the removal of pines i.e. switch away from invasive ectos? Yeah, so that's a really important question. How you, the, the, the person asking the question is totally correct that the changes we see in soil happen very rapidly under pine invasion. 
Um, Suwillis and Raza Pogon, so those ones that are sort of driving the invasion front, those fungi have adaptations to persist in soil. So work from the native range suggests that they can last for certainly years, and in the case of Raza Pogon, possibly much, much longer once they're present. Um, so that component of the soil, once it's present, is probably going to be there for a very long time. The other fungi, those that come later on in succession, are probably more ephemeral. So they don't probably persist, but it almost doesn't matter because once you have that rise of Pogon and Suilis in the soil, it's going to persist and that's enough to allow pine to reinvade. Wow. Okay. Bit of a bummer. Uh yeah, sorry about that. It's not, not a good news day, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, okay, another question. I was wondering if sowing the native fungus to help the native tree establish in previous pine invasions is an option. Yeah, usually the way it's done is to put it into the nursery. So if you collect soil from a native with, with pr proper respect and understanding of, of not grabbing soil from a native forest that's under somebody else's ownership. But if you um, if you were to take soil from under native beech trees and apply it to, na to your nursery seedlings, you're going to kill some of them because you are gonna bring in some pathogens, but the ones that, that survive it will be much healthier. They will get mycorrhizae and then be well, well able to establish. Um, we need to think a little bit about where we're moving soil from and to because we don't want to be potentially spreading invasive species. And we might want to think about sort of eco-sourcing the soil. So if you're going to plant within a region, maybe you should be inoculating the seedlings with soil from that region. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Great, okay. Um, I might do one more question, um, but this is awesome. So basically what will happen with the questions, everyone, is that I will ask Ian to answer all the questions that we don't get to, and I'll send the answers around to everyone who's asked them. So yeah, thank you all for these questions. So I'll just do one more. Um, does the exotic fungal community diminish over time? Oh wait, no, sorry, we've already asked a question like that. Um, okay, if welding conifers are controlled in an area, has there been any tracking of changes in fungal composition? Does it revert back to a more pre-invasion composition and over what time frame? I think we maybe yeah, have covered I think that. I think we've covered that. I mean, and the answer, whether there's been a study for it is yes. Uh, so we have collected the data and we're analyzing it right now. So I can't tell you the results because I don't actually know them yet. Uh, but Sarah Sapster, who, who's working with me, has, has got some of that data. And we're hoping to continue that work with if funding uh, continues. Gotcha. Um, question about the lack of native fungi. Um, is the lack of native fungi due to the lack of dispersal mechanisms for them? That's a really good question. Um, a lot of fungi disperse by airborne spores, but a lot of other fungi don't. Um, and we, New Zealand's native fungi have a lot of truffle-like fungi, so they, they look like animal dispersed fungi. But we don't know what animal dispersed them, whether it must have been a bird, um, but we don't know which bird, maybe weka, maybe kiwi. Um, so it could it could very well be that there is that the loss of some important dispersal agent, uh, like a bird species, is contributing to the slow spread of the native fungi. But others should be able to spread because, um, yeah, it just depends. As I said, there are a lot of different fungi that do this, so, so trying to generalize is very difficult. Um, at least some should be able to disperse. Yeah. Okay. No, that sounds awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ian. Um, this has been a oh, really fantastic not. talk. Yeah. And thank you yeah, all for your questions pleasure. as well. We received some great questions too. So yeah, we'll get around to answering them. But yeah, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye.